In this lecture, the osseous, articular and muscular structures of the hip complex will be discussed. Taken together, the right and left hip bones are referred to as the pelvic girdle. The hip is formed by three fused bones. These bones include the ilium, superiorly, the ischium, posterior interiorly, and the pubis, antero inferiorly. The ilium is attached to the lateral border of the sacrum at the sacroiliac joint. The rami of the pubic bones on either side articulate with each other medially at a cartilaginous joint known as the pubic symphysis. Being part of the appendicular skeleton, the purpose of the hip is to append the lower limbs to the axial skeleton and to bear the weight of the upper body. The weight of the body is transferred to the femur at the acetabulofemoral joint, which, like the glenohumeral joint of the shoulder, is a synovial ball and socket joint. The acetabulum of the hip is deeper than the glenoid cavity, and so the range of motion of the leg is not as great as that of the arm, but it is still capable of a significant range of motion. The acetabulum of the hip is deepened and stabilized by the acetabular labrum in a similar fashion to the glenoid labrum in the glenoid cavity of the shoulder. The hip bones, along with the coccyx and sacrum, form a bony enclosure which protects the digestive, urogenital and reproductive organs of the lower abdomen. There exists a degree of sexual dimorphism between males and females in the structure of the pelvic girdle. The female pelvis is significantly broader than the male pelvis, which is narrower and taller. This is so that the female pelvis can accommodate childbirth. The ilium, or iliac bone, is the uppermost and largest bone of the pelvis and is divided into two parts, the body and the ala. The two parts are separated on the medial surface by the arcuate line and on the lateral surface by the margin of the acetabulum. The ilium is bordered by the pubis inferior anteriorly and the ischium inferior posteriorly. The ischium or ischial bone forms the lower and back part of the pelvis and is divided into three parts, a body, a superior ramus and an inferior ramus. It is bordered superiorly by the ilium and anteriorly by the pubis. It forms approximately one third of the acetabulum. The pubis or pubic bone forms the lower and front part of the pelvis and is divided into three parts, a body, a superior ramus and an inferior ramus. It is bordered superiorly by the ilium and posteriorly by the ischium. It forms approximately one fifth of the acetabulum. The femur or thigh bone is very strong and is the longest bone in the body. The head of the femur is a projection at the proximal end of the thigh bone and is supported by the neck of the femur. The head is smooth and globular. Its surface is covered with cartilage to articulate with the acetabulum of the pelvis to form the hip joint. The neck of the femur connects the head of the femur to its shaft. Most of the blood supply to the head runs along the surface of the neck and therefore injury here can lead to a vascular necrosis of the head. The shaft of the femur is a tubular body that is slightly twisted and curved. Along the length of the shaft of the femur, posteriorly, is a landmark feature called the linea aspera. Between the epicondylar projections at the distal end of the femur, onto which the collateral ligaments of the knee attach, is the patella or kneecap. The patellar surface is a shallow area on the distal end of the femur. It lies anteriorly between the anterior superior portions of the femoral condyles, which accommodate the patella. Next, we will move on to the articular structures of the hip complex. We've already covered the hip or acetabulofemoral joint, so we will now cover the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis, or symphysis pubis, is a secondary cartilaginous joint that consists of a fibrocartilaginous interpubic disc that lies between the symphyseal surfaces of the bodies of the right and left pubic bones. This joint is reinforced by the superior and inferior pubic ligaments. Next, the right and left sacroiliac joints, which are synovial joints and formed between the auricular surfaces of the ilium and sacrum on their respective sides. Each sacroiliac joint is reinforced by anterior, interosseous, and posterior sacroiliac ligaments, along with sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments. Finally, we will review the muscular structures of the hip region, and we will begin with the muscles of the gluteal region, a group of muscles of the lower limb that attach to the pelvic girdle on one end 
and to the femur and tibia on the other. They are involved in movements of the hip and thigh and also help to stabilize these during standing, balancing and walking. The muscles of the hip can be broken into a number of groups and we will start with the muscles of the gluteal region, specifically the gluteus maximus. This muscle is involved with extension of the femur from the flexed position. It also laterally stabilizes the hip and knee joints. Then the gluteus medius, which has a prominent role in stabilizing the pelvis. The anterior part is involved with flexion and internal rotation of the thigh, while the posterior part is involved with extension and external rotation of the thigh. And then the gluteus minimus, which also helps to stabilize the pelvis and abducts the thigh. As the name suggests, the tensor fascia lata tenses the fascia lata, or ITB, resulting in abduction, flexion, and internal rotation at the hip joint. The piriformis helps to stabilize the hip, but also externally rotates, abducts, and extends the hip. Obturator internus externally rotates, abducts, and extends the hip joint, while the obturator externus adducts and externally rotates the hip joint. The gemelli muscles are a pair of muscles which are deep to the gluteus maximus. When the thigh is extended at the hip joint, the gemelli muscles laterally rotate the thigh at the hip joint. However, when the thigh is flexed at the hip, the gemelli muscles abduct the thigh. And the final muscle in the group is the quadratus femoris, which externally rotates and adducts the hip. The next group of muscles are those of the thigh, which act on the femur, tibia and fibula. We covered these in the knee lecture. They are involved in movements of the thigh and leg and also help to stabilize these during standing and balancing. For descriptive purposes, the muscles of the thigh are divided into three distinct compartments, anterior, posterior, and medial. The muscles of the anterior compartment mainly flex the thigh at the hip joint and extend the leg at the knee joint. They consist of five muscles. We will start with iliopsoas, which is actually composed of two muscles, iliacus and psoas major. The tendons of these two muscles unite to form one common iliopsoas tendon, which inserts into the lesser trochanter of the femur. The iliopsoas muscle flexes the thigh at the hip joint. Psoas minor flexes and laterally flexes the lumbar vertebral column. It also assists in the upward rotation of the pelvis. Sartorius is a biarticular muscle and flexes, abducts, and externally rotates the thigh. Sartorius also flexes and internally rotates the leg at the knee joint. Then we have the quadriceps femoris, which is a combined term for four muscles, including rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius. The tendons of these four muscles unite to form one common quadriceps tendon, which inserts into the patella and subsequently the tibial tuberosity. The fiber of the quadriceps tendon travel superficial to the patella. The quadriceps femoris muscle extends the knee and the final muscle in the anterior compartment group is the articularis genus. This muscle retracts the suprapatellar bursa and elevates the articular capsule of the knee joint during extension. Next, the muscles of the medial compartment, which mainly adduct the thigh at the hip joint, and consist of pectineus, adductor longus, brevis and magnus, and gracilis. The pectineus adducts, internally rotates and weakly flexes the thigh. It is also involved with stabilization of the pelvis. Adductor longus adducts and flexes the hip joint, while adductor brevis adducts and flexes the hip joint as well. It works in conjunction with adductor longus. Adductor magnus has two parts, an adductor part and a hamstrings part. The adductor part, as the name suggests, adducts the thigh, but it also weakly flexes the thigh. The hamstrings part extends and externally rotates the thigh. And then the gracilis, which adducts and flexes the thigh, Gracilis also internally rotates the knee joint. The final group of muscles that we will review are those of the posterior compartment of the thigh, and these are known as the hamstrings. They mainly extend the thigh at the hip joint and flex the leg at the knee joint. Biceps femoris lies laterally within the posterior compartment and attaches to the ischium and femur to the fibula. It extends the thigh at the hip joint and flexes the leg at the knee joint. It's divided into its long and short heads. The semitendinosus extends the thigh at the hip joint and flexes and internally rotates the leg at the knee joint. And then finally, the semimembranosus. Like the semitendinosus, the semimembranosus extends the thigh at the hip joint and flexes and internally rotates the leg at the knee joint. In this lecture, we reviewed the osseous, articular and muscular structures of the hip joint. 
This lecture was prepared for students enrolled in the physiotherapy program in the UC School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science. Images were taken from the complete anatomy software application prepared by 3D4 Medical.